Good evening and welcome to students, faculty, staff, alumni, friends of Transylvania, and a special welcome to tonight's speaker, Nisha Anand, who's beaming in from Berkeley, California to be with us tonight. Uh, let me mention that we do have closed captioning enabled if you'd like to take advantage of that by just uh, pressing the button on the bottom right of your screen. I'm Greg Partain, professor of music and the current director of the Creative Intelligence Series. I've been uh, looking forward to this event very much because the topic, which is choosing common ground in divided times, speaks to a, a yearning I know many of us have experienced in recent years as we've witnessed a deterioration in much of our public discourse and social structures more generally, um, an intensification of our divisions. It must be possible, we think, in our hopeful hours to bridge some of the chasms that would swallow us up if only we had the tools. Well, Nisha, as she prefers to be called, offers such tools and a hopeful vision. An Indian American activist, she is a national leader for social and racial justice. A person who has experienced many times the, that, humanity, that the humanity connecting us can be stronger than what has been created to divide us. Nisha is the CEO of Dream Corps, a national nonprofit co-founded by her mentor, Van Jones, to save and transform lives by building unconventional relationships with unlikely partners. At Dream Corps, she works at the intersection of criminal justice reform, green economics, and tech equity. She teams up with storytellers, organizers, and policy experts to enact solutions to wicked problems. Tonight, she'll tell us about some of those experiences and we'll have time for questions at the end. Um, you can type those in in the question and answer feature at the bottom of your screen at any time. Before we turn to Nisha, I do have two uh, quick creative intelligence announcements. Uh, to any student or really anybody that would like to join Nisha tomorrow for an informal session, we're meeting at 1230 in the Campus Center, Pioneer Room A, and feel free to bring your lunch to that. Uh, she'll join us on the big screen via Zoom. And everyone, I hope you will mark your calendars to hear our next creative intelligence speaker, Hannah Drake, spoken word poet and political activist from Louisville, who will visit us in person in Carrick Theater on Thursday, March 10 at 7 p.m., Thursday, March 10. Uh, that event also will be live streamed if you prefer to attend that way. So with that, please join me in sending an invisible and silent, but resounding and heartfelt Transylvania welcome to Nisha Anand. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. I am really excited to talk about this topic of how to find common ground in divided times. And I really appreciate everyone who showed up over Zoom. I think the first place we can find common ground is being fatigued and exhausted of Zoom. Um, but the fact that you are here today, I really appreciate it. And I'm excited to tell you what I know and a little bit about my experiences. But I first am hoping that one of the reasons that you're here is, is because you're ready to find that common ground. And like a lot of folks here, you don't like the divisiveness. Um, as Dr. Partin said, it's taken over nearly everything. You are exhausted with the constant problems that keep popping up one after another. There seems to be something else that needs our attention that seems like a horrible problem we can't solve. You might be that you don't know how to make things any better for us, for yourself, for your communities, for other people. It just seems like these problems are too big and too hard and there's nowhere to go to solve the problems in a way that feels right. Some folks I've Talk to it, thinks it's hope. Are quite scared that if they come out loud and publicly and say, I care about X, Y, or Z, that there's always right around the corner somebody to ridicule you or shame you or call you out on something and how you said it. And that's created a lot of uh, inaction and discomfort with kind of making a stand. 
And so I'm wondering if anybody resonates with that. I have my chat open. I'm wondering if anyone resonated with that that's here today. If you want to write a yes, that's me or some of that, not all of it, or absolutely. Um, yes, there are a few folks out there that, that have that exhaustion and hopelessness. And on my worst days, I have it too. But I also want to say that lesson number one is already learned. That's common ground. That's actually how most Americans feel today. That same sense of exhaustion, that same sense of not wearing, not knowing where to turn. We all have gone through so much together. We have lost so much over the last few years. We have so much pain that we share. And through that common pain, I believe we can find common purpose. And what my job is at Dream Corps from that common purpose to give you guys a common project for anyone who comes in our doors, what's a common project we can do together. So I already want to say there's common ground already um, with folks who are on this call that we're feeling that sense of exhaustion. But I'm not going to end my talk there, although I feel I could have. Uh, what I want to tell you is that this is how the majority of the country feels at this moment. And if you were to listen to the media or believe the media, that would not be the message you'd be getting. Right now, our media would have you convinced. Um, I'll try to do a, a little bit of a both sides on this. The media, if you're listening to them, have convinced you that progressives are looking for ways to yell racism and sexism at everything that's said. They want to cancel people at every turn. They're looking to regulate all sorts of activities, take away your individual rights. You'll, the media will have you believe that you know every progressive on the street hates America and loves communism. And I know that's not true. And on the flip side, if you listen to the media, it'll have you believing that conservatives are all trying to send anyone who doesn't look like a certain way out of the country or that they love America so much, but only for America that is white and straight and male and only for people who look and act like them. Neither of these things are true. That is a big lie. And hopefully that's the folks that are here today listening to this. We hate these divisions. We're not in either of those categories and we want to move away from device. Find a way back to each other, find a way to heal those divisions. And for me, what's important for me is finding a way to act to make the world a better place. I'll just share with you four tips. The good news about these four tips is the first one is something that you already know how to do. Um, it's something we're born with. So number one tip strategy I want to share with you is to embrace who you are. You already are common ground. I was born in the South, in Atlanta, Georgia. Uh, I was born in the 70s. Some folks might want to do math. I will do it for you. I'm 45 years old, so you're not thinking about that the rest of the, the way. I, that actually happens quite a bit. Um, my son Googled me the other day, and uh, Nisha Anand comes up with age afterwards. So I must throw out a bunch of dates. But so, you know, I grew up in the South in the 80s. It was very much a black and white town, and I did not fit in. I was a misfit. And it certainly led me to feelings of exclusion. Where do I belong? How do I fit in? But it also gave me the superpower of being a chameleon, of actually learning how to be in different groups and with different people. And so I was a mix of a lot of things. I was this um, very polite Southern girl. I was a first generation uh, immigrant kid. I was a punk rock kid, but I was also a debate nerd. I absolutely had to get straight A's. It was part of my identity, but I was also a rabble rouser, an activist. I was a ringleader of all sorts of shenanigans and a troublemaker in my own right. And so I didn't quite fit in. I was a mix of all of these things, but I think you are too. And being able to balance that and being able to balance those identities, we do it seamlessly. Whatever makes you up, whoever you are authentically, that's already a balance of all of these different worlds. And I'd argue that's actually who America is too, a mix of so many different things. And we know how to balance it in ourselves. I actually think we know how to balance it outside ourselves well too. 
you're able to live. It's actually quite that simple that you're able to live with all these different identities in yourself. I think it, it, it could be that simple to do that in this country. I was also a natural bridge. I was a bridge between the old world and the new, quite literally. I translated not just words for my parents who immigrated here, but I also would have to translate situations. And we all know how to do that translation too. Even if you're not a first generation kid or you don't have that immigrant parents, you're constantly translating. I still have to tell my dad how to double click on something to open you know, a document or what a right click would do. Just like I go to my kids and I have to have them explain to me like why they're only taking a picture of their eye. Like that's the etiquette on Snapchat. It's not something I naturally would ever understand. So I'm going to my kids to translate for me just like you know, I did for my parents. And so I think we are natural balancers and understanders of nuance and in that difference that's within ourselves. And I also think naturally we know how to translate between two worlds. We've done that our whole lives. But for some reason right now with the divisiveness we have, we don't think that's possible. We think the differences that we can see are so deep and so painful that there's no way we could bridge between them. I know that's not so. And so that's why I say the first step is just be who you are and embrace that you already embody common ground. You already are a bridge builder and a translator. You lived a nuanced life. And so our politics need to also have that nuance that there are many sides that make up what's happening. So when I think about what divides us today, a lot of people will be like, yeah, sure. But have you ever had a conversation with someone who's on the other side of the vaccine debate or the mask debate or something like that that seems so heated and, oh my God, we can't possibly have this conversation? I want to tell you I have. Sometimes those conversations go well, sometimes they don't. But I can tell you that, that we know how to do this. And I wasn't always on a path where I would open up myself to conversations with people of difference of opinion. In fact, like I mentioned, I was a bit of a troublemaker as a youth. I've been arrested over a dozen times for different civil disobedience causes. So like literally locking myself to buildings, to protest, you know, some type of injustice. That was who I was as a child. So I wasn't always so open to other ideas. I certainly thought my way was the only way and the right way. But in 1998, I was arrested in the military dictatorship of Myanmar. And I went there out of protest. I went with 18 other international activists from around the world. There were six of us from the US, the rest were from Indonesia, Australia, Thailand, a few other countries. And we went in to hand out these leaflets that said, we are your friends from around the world. We support your hopes for human rights and democracy. That's it. That's all this leaflet said, but it's a military dictatorship and you cannot bring anything inside that country that's not approved by the dictatorship. And we were there on August of 98 because we are commemorating this a 10 year anniversary. August 8th of 88, which was 8888, there was a student uprising and a call for democracy. And these students who wanted democracy, they were massacred, about 10,000 of them. We don't have a good count, 10,000 people killed. The rest fled to the border regions. Some have never returned. And the military cracked down in that date had effectively shut down all political discourse. For the 10 years between 88 and 98 when I arrived there, I think the schools were open for a total of two years during that 10 year period. They didn't want people to gather, to talk to. And so as a young college activist, I felt very passionate about this cause. And I signed up and I agreed to go there not thinking about the consequences because I was fearless and a bit full of myself and feeling quite powerful. Um, and all 18 of us were arrested. We were held for several days before we saw any diplomatic official, before we knew who else had been arrested of our group, before we knew anything. And about a week into our um, imprisonment, we were shipped off to a trial. The trial was conducted entirely in Burmese, so I couldn't understand a word of it. But at the end, what was said in English was that we had been sentenced to five years of hard labor was how it was phrased. And at that moment was probably the first time I felt fear. I wasn't quite sure what was gonna happen. I worried about my family. I didn't know how we were gonna get out. 
And the next day they woke us up quite early and just deported all of us. So I had this night where I thought, you know, I could be spending five years of my life inside this military dictatorship. And then I was deported. And I found out when we got off the plane, one of the reasons that the deportation um, happened was we had a ton of international pressure from all around the world because we had all these different countries. It was a well-planned action. So the media was alerted, news, you know, every news station around the world was covering it. There was a lot of pressure for them to release us. And there was one diplomat from the United States who flew halfway across the world to help secure our freedom, Representative Chris Smith, who's a Republican from New Jersey. And if you haven't guessed it yet, I'll, um, I'll let you know. I identify as very progressive and liberal, and, and I've kind of always been that way. So when a Republican congressperson flew across the country to get me out of prison, uh, one, I was very thankful. Um, but then I told you I was a bit of a troublemaker. So I thought I have a very long plane ride with this representative back home. And I was an activist. I absolutely had an agenda. And I thought I could spend this whole ride talking to him about issues I care about. Maybe I can convince him. I also mentioned I was a debate nerd, so I loved winning arguments. And so I thought maybe I'll spend that entire ride talking to him about issues where we disagree and trying to convince him that my way is the right way. But actually that's not how I spent that ride home. Um, I don't know who led the conversation. I mean, he certainly could have. So I'd like to say I was very aware and, and I knew what I was doing, but maybe I didn't. I, I really don't know. What I remember though, is the conversation we did have flying back to the States. He was the head of the Human Rights Commission. It's why he came across the world to help get us out of, out of prison. And so I found out we had a lot in common. The conversation, we talked about human rights violations around the world. And I found that we had so much agreement about what's acceptable and not acceptable on a world stage that we actually found places then domestically where we could extend those same types of human rights violations. I did not push him on areas where we knew I dis we disagreed. I only stayed in that where we agreed. And from there, I felt like a lot could be done. Burma at that moment, Myanmar was my cause. There was a lot more we could do together, which we did do together to try to work on human rights and democracy in, in Burma. And had I spent that entire conversation really just trying to win my argument thinking, oh, he's a Republican and I'm a Democrat, therefore we can't get anything done. I would have missed out on a huge opportunity to help make change, but also I would have lost what I think transitioned me to the life I'm leading now as the CEO of Dream Corps in trying to build bridges across every type of divide to get things done. So I tell you this because I had a choice in that moment of what conversation to have. And I think that's the choice all of us have when we encounter someone with a difference. And if you can do it in those situations, I know that we can do it now. And so I'm, I'm gonna go ahead to my second point since we're here. The first one was uh, be yourself, <laughs> um, be authentically yourself. Um, Remember you are common ground, you know how to do it. The second strategy I wanna have is start small. Yeah, maybe representative Chris Smith wasn't the smallest um, way I could have started, but it still was small, it was individual, it was one-on-one. -on -one. And that's what I wanna ask everyone here to do. The challenge I wanna have for you is to show up as yourself, but let other people show up as themselves in the conversation. We know that diversity is the source of strength. It's the source of strength in any company, in any project that you're working on. It's a source of strength in this country. There have been countless amounts of studies that have showed you both qualitatively and quantitatively, every which way it can be tested, the diversity is helpful and um, better. You know, Companies, if everyone who's developing a product, for instance, was exactly alike, the product would be quite limited in who it served, what problem it solved, if a board of directors at a company was homogenous and all were exactly the same, they would all have the same blind spots and it would cripple the company. It has taken a long time to learn that. Um, we all have our blind spots. We need that diversity of opinion to help us think better. We might be so sure that we have studied everything possible, maybe in, in one course that you're taking, you have studied deeply this one area, this one problem, there are still blind spots there in every single text we read, every opinion we, and we know that as academics and students, you know that 
you know, the author has some sort of bias, but why can't we say that in politics? Why do we go into a political discussion where we think my way is the only way and I can't possibly have a blind spot? It doesn't make any kind of sense. And so if for me to show up as myself, authentically progressive in a conversation I have with someone on the different side of the debate, I want them to show up authentically as themselves. That's the only way I'm gonna learn what I don't know. You don't know what you don't know. And so to start small, you have to want to know somebody that's outside of your own experience. You have to want that. I can't make you want that, but I'm telling you it's a source of strength to know that. And um, I have a poll actually. So if I'm telling you to start small, so uh, Julie, who's on the back end making all this magic happen, I'm gonna have you launch a poll because the first thing I want you to do is find someone across the divide to have this conversation with. But I found this poll um, yesterday from one of, from an Ipsos study in 2021, what divides Americans the most? What's the greatest driver of division amongst Americans? So I'm gonna give you just like a few seconds to just pick one, what you think is the number one divider amongst Americans. And really all of these are quite big divider, dividers, race, education level, political affiliation, religion. These have definitely um, driven up division you know, over the last 250 years. This country is about 250 years old, uh, almost. So if we have enough votes in there, let's see what you guys think is the biggest divider as of 2021, what people identify. See if we can show the, the answers. And if you didn't vote, vote. What do you think? And don't Google the answer. All right, so um, a lot of people voted. It's very interesting that no one thought race was the biggest divider and you're actually right. That was the fourth on this list. That one is the, the least divisive of these identity factors. Political affiliation, which y'all guessed is number one by a lot. That that is the number one thing dividing people right now. And the second one actually is religion that most people do not feel a commonality across religion. That was the second. It's definitely a lot less than political affiliation, but I was surprised by that as well. Followed by race and then education, education level and then race. It's fascinating to me. Where I come from, I think it's more race. And I found out that Democrats actually are even more divisive amongst, um, around politics than their, their Republican counterparts, that they feel like they have nothing in common with anyone across the political divide. Um, which is quite fascinating. So any of those categories would be good to have a conversation in, but I would suggest you do try to find somebody across the political affiliation and try to understand. And before I give some tips on how to have that conversation, I just wanna say that um, a word on dehumanization, that since the beginning of time, one of the only ways in history, looking back, all of the atrocities the biggest ones that we think of have been committed because of de because dehumanization started the pathway to violence, I guess would be the easiest way to say it. When you can make somebody the other, it is easy then to do horrible things to the other. And we've seen that time and time again. And I see it today, that in fact, there is a lot of othering that happens all around in order for us not to find each other and not to connect. And so one of the things that you have to do in these conversations is to fight that dehumanization every step of the way. And that means to listen, to understand, not listen to win an argument, not listen to, you have to understand where someone's coming from. We are categorizing people as, oh, you're a this or you're a that. And we use it, I mean, even my children use it. What do the Trumpers think, for instance? What do those lefties think? What do you, like, there are these languages, and I'm not using some of the, the worst words, but I think you've heard them over the last few years for sure. That is dehumanizing language, and that can lead to violence. We have to stop that in our own language. And so one of the things I do ask all of my staff before they tweet anything, before they launch any campaign, is does what I'm doing dehumanize the or other anybody? Does it divide this country further, or does it bring us closer together? 
and they are not, we cannot allow ourselves to be that, um, we can't allow ourselves to be a vehicle for that further division. So start, start small and refuse to dehumanize. We have to be open to truly knowing who the other person is. What are all those different misfit parts that make up who you are? And get curious about what are those different misfit parts that make up someone else? The reason you think the way you think is because of a whole lot of events that led up to you thinking the way you think, to you being the way you're being. That's true for every other person you encounter. Get curious. We're fascinating, fascinating creatures. So that brings us to my third strategy, which I think you guys are probably already there, which is to listen deeply and to stay curious. I was a high school debate nerd, like I said, and I loved, loved, loved to win an argument. But winning an argument and understanding someone or someone else's views are entirely different things. Now, I still love to win. It's why I do what I do. I want to win big, giant um, reform. I do a lot of work on legislation. I want to do a lot of things. I want to win. But to me, it's not about winning an argument. It's about winning the future. And the future I see is one with freedom and dignity for all people. So my winning strategy isn't about dehumanizing. It isn't about winning the argument. It's really about finding a solution that it's radically inclusive. It can't exclude anybody. I know what that felt like. Felt like. like I told you, I was a misfit growing up. It has to be a solution that's radically inclusive. Otherwise, it's not winning. That's not the future I'm fighting for. So people know immediately if you are listening because you want to win an argument or if you are listening because you want to convert them to your way of thinking, they know that is very different than listening to understand. You know it. You know when you're really being heard. You can see it when you show up to a conversation. You know how it feels when someone really hears you and really sees you. Everybody knows that. Cultivating that presence to be there and to really want to understand someone's views, that's what we have to do. And so I know that when I tell you to listen and stay curious, um, it is a bit about that, like what kind of what kind of misfit is here? What experiences led them to think that? I can understand that you think different than me, but why? Find out who they are, understand, and, and, and that's really it about listening to stay curious. What is it? Often when I talk to students and on college campuses, I do hear a lot about safe space. And I live here in Berkeley and you might have heard a few years ago, obviously it's pre-pandemic. We, um, the students of Berkeley shut down talks by some Republican, uh, I can't remember what, uh, not, I wouldn't call them Republican. I'd say like more alt-right, uh, more nationalist uh, type speaker. I can't even remember who it was. Big protest, they shut him down, he couldn't speak. And that's when it was the height of this safe space debate. And do I need to listen to somebody who I think thinks so differently than me, they should not be allowed to speak because it's not safe. I do not want you, when I say start small, I don't want you to engage in a conversation with someone where you're not physically safe or something that is too painful to go into. I do not want you to be physically unsafe. So in that sense, I also agree that you need a safe space to have this conversation. But I do not want you to be intellectually safe. That does nobody good. You have to be able to talk about your ideas. You have to actually be able to debate in a way that recognizes what you think, what the other person thinks. That is what the great American experiment of democracy is supposed to be, where you could have many ideas because we come from different places, states versus federal, rural versus urban. Now we have coastal versus everywhere else everywhere else, right? There's these, all these things that we are supposed to be the democracy that figured out how to have all those voices there. And so I wanna challenge you to allow yourself to be intellectually unsafe. You do not get stronger in the gym if you go and lift the light weights. You gotta lift the heavy weights to get stronger. And so that's what I wanna encourage you to do. You don't, don't conflate the two. I do not want you to be physically unsafe. I don't want you to engage. There are plenty of people to talk to. If there are people that it hurts too much to talk to, do not do that. But do talk to people who think differently. My mind has been opened by so much just from doing that. And so 
just some tips because I told you I give you strategies and, and it's almost like I'm doing a little more lecture than giving you strategies. There are two sentences that I always have in my back pocket when I feel myself about, about ready to shut down. Tell me more about why you think that. I don't think that, tell me more about why you think that. Helps them know you wanna understand. Or I see it a little differently. If I need to like end the conversation and I, I just know we're not gonna see something eye to eye, I say, oh, I see that a little differently. And then it opens them up to ask me, well, how do you see it? And that's okay. That's not, I see it differently. So I am right and you're wrong. It's acknowledging you see it one way and I see it another, and that's okay. What can we do about it from there? It's important. Um, we've done that conversation in much harder times and much harder ways. So being able to talk to somebody on the other side, the example I gave earlier was like mask or vaccines. I promise we've had this conversation in much harder times in US history and even in our own histories. I'm sure you can point to times when it's done. And I go back to my origin story a little bit and how I got to this country was my dad was born in India right at the time of the partition in 45. So when British colonial officials left, well, when, when the colonization of India ended, when uh, British rule left, there was a lot of, India is a very diverse country, a lot of different languages, a lot of different people, a um, lot of different, yeah, ethnicities even, religions, so many, there was a struggle right then. Should India be one nation or should it be a few different nations? What should it be? And as the British left, they decided they're just gonna draw a line and divide up a few of these regions. And one of the lines of partition, usually we refer that to the line they drew of what would become India and what would become Pakistan. And then they left, deal with it. Here's two nations, we're out of here. This line that was drawn, my family was Hindu who living on what would become the Pakistan side of the border. And a lot of Muslims were living on the other side of the border, on the Indian side, which was more um, Hindu. That led to the largest forced migration in human history. People had to flee at that moment because a swell of violence took over that area and people fled. And so my family being Hindu trapped on one side of the border had to go to the other side and same with Muslim families. In this partition, anyone that was born at that time and anyone from India, they have a story about that time. And our story was this, my parents went into hiding in their neighborhood where they had lived. And my dad was a very little boy, he's about two years old. There were eight kids in the family at that time. And they were all hiding in, um, in this one home. And anytime these vigilante groups and militias would stroll by and look for people who did not belong. They would kill, of course, the family if they found them or take them away to jail or kill the family that was hiding them. It was a high stakes situation for my family. And I grew up hearing this one story about my dad one, one of those times when he was a little baby and he started crying when the men walked into the home. And my grandfather faced with that moment of my dad crying and all of his other children there had made the decision that he would sacrifice my father to try to save the whole family. And my grandmother grabbed him or store, so the story goes, grabbed my father and shook him until he stopped crying pretty violently. You'll hear the story. And he stopped at the very right moment he stopped. I grew up knowing this was part of my history and it's it's in me. It, I definitely think it's part of why I feel so tied to, um, to the cause of ending oppression. What I didn't realize till much later was obviously there was a Muslim family that was hiding my family, obviously. Where else were they hiding? And I asked about that later in life, um, probably around the time I was in college. And my dad told me, oh yeah, you know, that Muslim family, they were, you know, in the neighborhood, they hit us. And slowly they started opening up a little bit more. And my grandfather told me that at one point he heard the family was asked to swear on the Quran that they were not hiding anyone in their homes. 
And this family took great risk to themselves and to everything they believed in, swore on their holy book that they were not hiding my family. And my family lived. That shared humanity that we have, that in when the stakes are so high, so we're not talking about a mean tweet that somebody sent out. We're talking about a life or death decision in the moment can find a way across every single kind of divide that's been created to still stand up for that humanity. That type of common shared human experience, that is not weak. That is not wishy-washy. That is not a kumbaya type of common ground. That is not selling out your principles to try to make compromise. That is hard, life-changing decision-making that shows the love for each other is stronger than the hate that's been created and what's been created to divide us. And so I encourage you for the uncle who you know voted differently or your old you know, childhood friend who seems to be tweeting some nonsense, that there is still a way to find that shared humanity. There is. And this divisiveness, we can all heal it. That's who we are. We know how to do it. We understand nuance and common ground. We understand the mix of things. If we can start healing some of these small divides, I think we can start healing some of the bigger ones. And so that was my point number, number three, listen deeply and stay curious. And because of, because of that, because my family stayed alive, my father was able much later in life to make the choice to immigrate to America and find his American dream which in fact was me. I'm kind of my parents' American dream. They had this dream for a better of life that I could have a bunch of possibilities that they didn't have. And that is for a lot of us, the story of a lot of folks, families, ancestors, relatives that came for the same reason. For those that were forced here and enslaved and endured some of the most horrific atrocities in human history, they also fought for our freedom and the freedom we have today. They fought for not just a different possibility for themselves, but for all of us. And we have to understand all that, all that ugliness that is here that's part of America. The ugliness of our past is also tied with the beauty, the beauty of our past. And that has to be a piece of who we are. And so when I think of patriotism, I'm not just thinking of the patriotism that, that uh, we usually talk about like put up an American flag and make sure you know your hands over your heart during the pledge. I'm talking about that patriotism that was the civil rights movement, the patriotism that was women fighting for the right to vote. That patriotism of all of our heroes and today we're seeing it again and again, especially with the racialized, the racial violence that's taking over our streets. We see people standing up and saying that we will build a future where everyone is free and where everyone has dignity. And that's a piece of my patriotism too. That's the American dream my parents came for. And that's what I wanna live and embody today. And so I, I wonder what that possibility is for the future we're trying to create. And there are a few things I know that have always been a piece of the American dream that we've always been trying to fight to and perfect. And I think of like this idea of, of forming a more perfect union we haven't formed a perfect union yet, but we can. In every single generation, we get that choice to do so. I think possibility, creating something that has never been invented before, that's a big piece of the American dream. I think opportunity, one thing we believe in across every political divide, if you're looking for common ground to find, is this idea of access to opportunity. It might look different. It might, we might not agree on who doesn't or who does have opportunity, but that is a very easy common ground thing to talk about. You want opportunity for all. We know that genius is evenly distributed throughout every community, but opportunity itself is not. And so breaking down those barriers to opportunity, we, we might have a different and urgency about where, but it is something that I find is easy to find common ground on. The other part I love about us here that's not the same in every other country is we have a little bit of a disregard for authority. Um, as Americans, and part of that American dream is, is we don't like to be told no. We don't relent in the face of adversity. We know what needs to be done and nothing is going to stop us. And so that piece of the American dream I really resonate with. And that's also part of why I think finding this common grounds, we can find 
that possibility and that future is so essential and so necessary right now. So people, this is the point when I'm talking to some of my friends and they're like, okay, great, fine. I'll, you know, talk to my uncle, you know, who's kind of a, a jerk, but um, how is this going to actually change the world? And I have to tell you, I know it's possible because I've been part of history and we've done it. And so if you give me, I'm, I want to get to questions. So I'm going to wrap this up in, in five minutes with one final story so we can get to all your questions and answers. So please start thinking of them. But the final story I want to tell you about is about nine years ago when I interviewed for this job at DreamCore, which I'm now the CEO with. with. But first I, I interviewed for a fundraising job. And the final interview was an interview with our founder, Van Jones. And on the interview, Van kind of walked me through what he thought we would do together if I got this job. And he told me that he thought we could pass bipartisan criminal justice reform. And I laughed and told him I thought that was an oxymoron because as I mentioned, young activist over here, rabble rouser, I had been on the streets many times fighting for criminal justice reform and not a single Republican was on the streets fighting for me. So he said, no, no, we'll pass bipartisan criminal justice reform, unheard of. But he walked me through the argument. He said, Nisha, you and I come to it from our angle as, as you know, good progressives. We think that this is an unjust system that has treated certain people unfairly since its inception. It has unequal consequences for different communities. We think it's unfair. That's why we want to see it reformed. But he walked me through that the Republicans he had met and talked to saw something different. The fiscal conservatives saw a very bloated system that takes more and more taxpayer dollars every single year. They have to raise taxes and no one is getting better. So it's like a sunk, it's an industry that makes no sense. More and more money for worse and worse outcomes. So the fiscal conservatives wanted to see a change. He told me that libertarians also had a vested interest in making a change. The over-incarceration and kind of the reach into um, low-level drug offenses being you know, susceptible to the same type of three strikes laws as violent crimes meant that there was a large police state and a large mass incarceration state. Libertarians think there needs to be some reform. And also religious conservatives who believe in second chances and believe in redemption and actually believe that there should be some rehabilitation. Um, they don't see any of that in the criminal justice system. So he said, Nisha, they're coming to it for different reasons than you and I come to it. But do you think we could work with them and find some common ground and move something forward. And I really, I was still, a, I still wasn't a believer. And I, uh, but everything I had previously done hadn't worked. And Van also has a way of like really poking at things. He's like, well, how's that been working for you before? Not well, the way I was doing it before, I, I, I wasn't really winning. So I suspended disbelief, jumped in with him and our team and started working on a piece of legislation, which eventually got passed. This was under the Obama administration when we started. But during the Trump administration, we had to ask ourselves, should we still keep working on this bill? And Van asked each of us, he said, those people inside, the people we're fighting for, the people you wanna make a difference for, they do not care who is in the White House. They do not care who, what is made up of Congress, then it was still majority Republicans in both the House and Senate. They do not care who helps them. They just wanna get home. We cannot stop just because we might've had a more favorable set of outcomes in the previous administration. We have to keep going because every minute counts because there's nothing more urgent than freedom. And so we dug in and during the most divisive time in our lives of US history, people alive here on this call today, the most divisive times during the Trump administration, we had 89 senators sign the First Step Act, the bill that was necessary to make all of these changes in our mass incarceration system. 89 senators out of 100. It's not a little bit of bipartisanship. That's a whole lot of bipartisanship. And some folks said, you know, oh, it didn't go far enough. I think there were people on the left who hated it. It didn't go far enough. There were definitely folks on the right who hated it. You're just letting all these criminals out of jail, right? Either side could argue what they didn't like about it. But three years later, 20,000 people are home because of that bill. 20,000 people who did not need to be inside anymore. And that to me was winning. We worked with people across the aisle, 
a big, large coalition of folks and found what were the common ground, common sense solutions we could all agree on. Like women should not be shackled during childbirth, that crack and cocaine should not be sentenced differently, that there was enough common ground to make that much impact. So yes, I think finding common ground on a small scale is important because it leads our ability to find the possibility at a big scale. And so that's what we do at DreamCore. I know it's possible and you can do it at scale, but you have to first know how to do it yourself. And so I, you know, I do not think that we've lost our ability as Americans to dream our way out of the darkest times. That is what America has been. In every generation, we have found our way to do it out of it, how to find our way out of dark moments. And we are in a dark moment right now. There's no hiding that. We haven't lost our ability to dream. We've lost our ability to find each other to do the type of dreaming that's necessary. So if we find our way back to each other, if we find that common ground, then we can find our way to dream those big and those beautiful dreams. And so I'll end there. So we have time for some questions and answers. Uh, and I'd love to hear what's on your mind. Yes, we certainly do. Nisha, thank you so much. You've had some harrowing experiences uh, in your life and back at least a generation with your parents. Um, you know, as I'm hearing you talk, let, let me just get started while we're waiting for some questions to come in. Um, in a way, a, a kind of distinction is rising in my mind as I've listened to you uh, between maybe a model of cooperation that seeks um, maybe ultimately to eradicate people's perception of differences. You know, this is kind of the shared humanity model. Like the better you get to know somebody, the differences drop away and there's more understanding and so on versus um, a model of cooperation that maybe acknowledges and even accepts that differences and conflicts are going to be enduring. And yet you can still get something done along the way. I don't know. Do you, do you see a difference? Do you see I the do. difference I'm talking about? I see the difference and I'm definitely of the latter. I think when I grew up, we talked about America, the melting pot, which was very much the former. Everyone came to this country, all of their differences, and we all melted together. And now we're this one America. And there was like this erasure, erasure of differences is, is how I grew up. And I, as an immigrant kid, I was like, oh, I get it, you know? Um, and I love to rebel a little bit against that, uh, you know, against that notion. I think now we talked about the mosaic. I think my kids grew up knowing about the mosaic of America. Oh, bring all your differences and you make one, you know, pretty picture together. Um, and I think it's also a bit more, I just like to extend that analogy a little bit more. It's, it's more, instead of melting pot and instead of mosaic, it's more like a potluck nation. <laughs> that yes, we could all come together and make one bit pr pretty picture. But I think what also we do, if you think of a potluck is we all come to the table and bring our dishes, bring exactly who we are. And you will not just see a pretty picture, like you will actually taste something different that you never had, even if it's something you had the way someone else cooks it is different than the way you've cooked it. That is the type. I think we're more of a potluck nation. And that if you can know that if you're gonna to go to a potluck, you know, your spaghetti isn't gonna be my spaghetti, that's exactly what happens when we come to the table. I don't wanna simplify it, but, but sometimes it is simple. That's what happens when we come to the table. Who I hear on the other side is coming at me with their spaghetti. Let me learn about it. Why does it taste different? What makes it different? Okay, well, here's mine. What can we do together? You know, yeah, so definitely I, I identify more with the latter. Okay. Um, there is a question that came in and somehow the, the question itself disappeared. I wonder if that person would mind rephrasing it and resending. Um, so I have a question too. Uh, it seems to me like a lot of organizations have sprung up in recent years, national organizations that are dedicated to bridge building as, as kind of their mission. Um, what do you make of the fact that most of them seem to be started by people on the on the blue side of the political spectrum? Or do you think that's even an accurate take? It is an accurate take. There has been in the last few years, a huge, I think, I think something like in the last five years, there's been 150 new organizations oh. in the US that talk about bridge building as being a core of who they are. Um, that's a lot. 
And yes, most of them, if you peel back a few layers, you will see that most of them are a little bit more left of center, if not fully progressive. And they keep asking, oh, we want to talk to people on the right. We want to extend this olive branch. We want to want to do this. And yet they're not able to do it. There are a few organizations where there's a big ex exception to that, ones that were built um, bipartisan centers, right? Policy centers that are absolutely policy. They have to be bipartisan. And then also some of these organizations that from the beginning said, we are going to have a left-right coalition. I think the danger is a lot of folks want it to be apolitical. They're mm -hmm. like, well, we want to do common ground and bridge building and not talk about politics. We don't have politics those end up not getting a lot of diversity in the room. I think the ones that have been successful have said, I'm coming at it from this angle, you're coming at it from this angle, let's discuss. And one of the best experiments um, that I've seen is from Brave, Braver Angels. And I heard that your wife is actually part of the local Braver Angels chapter. That's true. Carolyn DuPont is the state uh, Braver Angels chair. And so Braver Angels believes that we can call on our better angels is where it com comes from to have these conversations. And they discovered that instead of having a courageous conversation or instead of having these transpartisan dialogues, they started looking at debates. What if we have debates and found out immediately that by framing it as a debate, it spoke to people that are more on the conservative side. They would show up for a debate if it was moderated. They felt their voices could be heard more they're more interested in battling the intellectual ideas, less interested in common ground for common ground sake. And they've been able to have quite amazing debates across the issues that you think would be the most divisive. Abortion, for one. They've had these great debates, which you can listen to and you can read about. They actually do it on radio and on podcasts. And you will be amazed at what can transpire when you have a framework. And this is where you create a safe space to have a debate where you know your voice is going to be heard as well as the other person is going to be heard. That's really important. No one wants to come to the table if they think they're just going to be shouted down and shut down and shamed. Safe in the sense of safe to get your opinion, your views out there, but not necessarily safe in the very good way that you talked about earlier because you may be challenged, intellectually yes. challenged. Um, Katie has sent a question that I think is probably on a lot of people's minds. How do you start a difficult conversation about vaccines, abortion, and so on with someone who you greatly disagree with, even if you've created a polite rapport with that person? Well, I actually uh, have a lot of experience. I kind of alluded to having a lot of experience to this because um, during the pandemic, I, my son, we had to keep him throwing. He's a pitcher for baseball. So he had to keep throwing, even though in Berkeley, California, actually in all of California, no organized sports were allowed. So we joined a team that had a lot of disregard for the pandemic and we traveled with them to Texas and to Arizona and to places that were not this Bay Area bubble we lived in. And I actually, the team was made up of people who were very different politically than I was. And so I had these conversations. And um, the first thing is to understand, we do not know why they feel that way. I think that's the first thing. There's a lot of assumptions that go into that conversation where I think, oh, this person, and I've made up this whole story about why they think the way they do. They've actually made up an entire story about me too and why I think the way I think. And so the first thing is to really want to understand what made them come to that. You might listen and ask and ask and ask. And you might be like, actually, there's no way we're going to find common ground here. That might be the outcome. But I found with my staff, and like I mentioned, Bay Area, I had four, and I'll just tell you on the vaccine side, I got vaccinated right away. My kids waited outside when they could get vaccinated. I thought that would be the makeup of my whole staff. I really did. I found out we were about to have a big event. I found out four of my staff members were not going to get vaccinated. We had no intention or plans to do it anytime soon. And it all, I'm like, but, but how could that be? And so we dug in a little, I actually turned to, to Van, our, our founder on this as well, to talk a little bit about this. And he's like, you might uncover something else if you just ask and find out what's going on. And we did. We uncovered that it wasn't that you know, they have been buying into, um, you know, a lot of anti-science rhetoric. It was just about like, I want to wait. My people have been experimented on. 
vaccines throughout history. And I want to wait a little, I will be safe. I will do everything safe. You can test me every day. I'm just not gonna get it for a few more months or a few more years or something mm -hmm. until it feels safe for me. And there was trauma, deep pain and trauma. And I believe, I think another part when I give speeches, I talk a lot about connecting through pain. I think understanding someone's pain is the first piece of understanding where they're coming from. There's pain that leads to a lot of our beliefs. So understanding that trauma meant I could relate. Then it didn't come, it didn't become about the politics of everything happening in the moment. It really came to understand where, pain, where our pain was. I was hurting a lot because my kids had missed out on so much of their lives. That's the pain I related to. Um, so you can relate on that level. I think common pain is a really important factor. I think grief is a really important factor to finding each other. And honestly, I would just, if you want a real tool, I would open it up with like, look, I know we don't agree on this and this could get really ugly. I don't want it to. I just really want to understand where you're coming from because I clearly don't understand it. Um, I think the other thing to do is to look for the first place where you can agree with something they said and say it as soon as you can. Because often we're like, I can't agree with anything this person says because then they'll think I totally agree with them. That's not true. It's not like you can use any example in your own life. You know, that's not true. We're again, we're nuanced people, we're misfits. So that when someone starts talking, someone you have a good rapport with um, is to find that first place where you can agree and say it loudly. It'll allow them the ability to agree with something you say. So listen for understanding and listen for agreement. It's really important to getting that conversation started. So they might be like, you know, I, I don't know what the, what the thing is, but like wearing a mask all day sucks. I cannot breathe. My kids have pimples all over their face. You'd be like, yeah, mine have pimples all over their face too. It really sucks. They're super embarrassed. They don't want to like talk to anyone. You can agree with that. That's true. It doesn't mean you don't believe we should wear masks, but you understand that it is uncomfortable. No one likes it. It does give the kids pimples. Like, sure, agree. Start there. It helps a lot. <laughs> so I don't hear you saying initiate the conversation with the motive of immediately changing the person's mind. Absolutely not. Do not okay. try to, like, do not. Um, that's not how you find, you know, the common grounds. Okay. Speaking of Carolyn DuPont, she has a question. Uh, she says, we're living in times when we don't share the same perception of facts. What approach do you take toward people who advance narratives not based on truth and reality? For example, the 2020 election was stolen and so on. You know, those are harder conversations to have for sure. Um, but I think you have to first figure out why someone thinks it. What is the source that they're reading and what have they read? Um, the thing around this one in particular, I ask is who's benefiting from us believing this? I believe American democracy requires us to believe that we can have fair and free elections. I think we're in a very dangerous place if we think that anyone can steal it. So one of the questions I ask is like, okay, but I've seen a lot of Republicans come out and say it was, it was fair and that there wasn't anything like, like, let's start talking about that. Like, okay, I hear that some people say it's stolen, but I also hear plenty of Republicans saying it wasn't. Like, how do we, you know, and, and try to use that um, because it is nuanced. And yeah, it's hard. I, uh, I certainly have a conspiracy theory uh, dad that I'm quite close to. We found out we have similar views on a few things. I'm not gonna share them with you now, but he's totally into conspiracy theories. And so he absolutely believes that there is a lot of fraudulent ballot casting, a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot. And he'll come at me and it's kind of funny now because he'll be like, have you heard this one? And because we have a good rapport, we get to attack it a little bit. And I'm like, well, let's pull it apart. Let's see what's in there, you know? And we'll do that for a while. I don't know if I ever change his mind. He might go home, maybe he does. But I don't do that. I do it because we get to be a little funny together. He knows I don't hate him for thinking that way. And we get to throw those around. This again as a dad from the from the baseball team. I mean, I wasn't gonna like hate them all. That would have been a miserable like two years. I was traveling around with this baseball team. Um, and it's become it's become fun. I kind of understand where he's coming from. He just wants to pick it all apart. Again, that mistrust of authority, that is a very American way to be. 
I have it. And so does he. That is a common ground place. Uh, but no, I don't think it's easy. I'm sorry. But it's worth doing. So one of our attendees has a question about um, a very dire topic, climate change. Who, uh, this person is very eager for global action on climate change, and they're worried that we're being forced to accommodate the powerful, um, while the less powerful don't have the power to insist on changes. And it feels like we don't have the time. I mean, this would apply to other issues too, but we don't have the time, um, maybe a decade or less. So how do you build bridges while at the same time taking bold steps? You know, there's the danger that we're not moving quickly enough to make a difference. So when there's an issue that's very, very urgent, yeah. is there really time for bridge building, I think is the question. Uh, yes, otherwise nothing will get done. I agree, it is an absolute urgent issue. I already think we're too late for the types of reforms that should have happened ages ago to help stop where we're at. So now we're at a point where we can fight for the largest possible set of outcomes and try to win it which is very hard to do, or we can find out where there's common ground right now and get those passed immediately and build on it. Very much like the First Step Act. Was it everything I wanted for criminal justice reform? No, but it's paved the way for more and more. And I think we're in that scenario now around climate where we need to get as much through as soon as possible. And unfortunately we live in this society, there are accommodations like, you know, capitalism doesn't go away tomorrow. If that's, you know, if I'm reading a little bit between the lines here, if we wait to overturn capitalism so that we don't have to look at businesses and, and their bottom line, well, the planet will be gone, to be quite frank. And so we've actually started a few years ago, we started trying to put together a bipartisan table on climate reform. And we did this quietly because it wasn't politically possible for some people to come out and say they wanted to work on climate, but we kept building it knowing that whoever won the last election, it could be a very different outcome of what was possible. And here we had Democrats controlling, um, which was a better outcome for climate or it should have been. And we still did not get, we still have gotten nothing done. So we need, we need people from the other party to work on it. And so we actually, you can check it out on the website and maybe I'll ask Heidi to put on our common ground platform. My Green for All team has built with a bipartisan set of people. Here are 10 policy solutions that we do have strong bipartisan support for. We never would have discovered them if we did not go out and listen to folks from different communities. And we actually have an upcoming common ground on climate um, listening stop in Texas. I don't know if we've done one in Kentucky, we'll have to look, but we have gone to different places to try to get people together and see where we can find uh, common ground. And it's actually been pretty, um, pretty impressive. And I'll say one other thing that I saw hidden in that question a little bit too, is that a lot of climate solutions that have been forwarded in the past will leave out the people who are hurt first and worst from polluters. And one thing you can count on us in terms of showing up authentically yourself and this is why I do not think uh, common ground means compromise. All of our conservative partners know that when DreamCorps comes in the room, they can count on us to bring that equity lens, that we are always gonna ask, how does this climate solution help the people who were hurt worse by the policy? And they count on us for that, just like I count on them to tell us how our ideas might hurt individual liberties, because that's not what I'm thinking about. And that kind of counting on each other has made us kind of a go-to resource for a lot of conservatives. In fact, not just do we work on climate policy, some of these organizations have been like, can you bring in a dream poor person to do a racial justice training for our conservative group? We really want to understand it. Um, and so I think that that's also something that happens when you see common ground. It opens up the door for more conversations and to share you know, your values and way of thinking with groups outside of your own echo chamber. Okay. Um, you know, I think we just have a few more minutes. Uh, there's a question from Gavin. Hello, Gavin. He says, how can we bridge the gap with groups that want to exclude others? And the example he gives is white supremacists. Yeah. Well, I told you radical inclusivity is one of my um, very strong values. And so if you can't come to the table saying that you want to make America better for everybody, it's a very hard for me 
it's one that I can't really solve in that moment. But there are some people who can solve it. And I can say one of the most hopeful things that I think about when days are really tough, and if you can't tell, I'm a bit of an optimist. <laughs> if you can't already tell. Right. <laughs> the days when I'm not an optimist, um, I remember that there are people that are ex-KKK members. And that is hard work. But if you've talked to anyone who is an ex-KKK member or ex-any member of a white supremacist group, the stories that they tell is it started with one person they were connected to that changed their way of thinking about that group. Mm -hmm. Now, that's not my work. It's not where I start. But I am so thankful for the people that can put themselves out there and be that one connection point that changes someone mind, someone's mind. Mm -hmm. So one of our attendees says uh, that they sometimes have difficulty in what to trust when reading articles or watching news, it's getting back to our alternate reality narratives a few minutes ago, but especially uh, with today's climate. So what are some ways to accurately know and understand what this person is fighting for? I definitely think you have to ask what, why does this person want me to believe the thing that they're telling? What's their motivation? I think when you're consuming media, it's really important. My dad is a Republican. I didn't mention that. He's a new immigrant Republican. So he's really about pulling himself up by the bootstraps. And in our family, debating politics is like the most favorite activity. So my dad and I can go at it, you know, forever. Maybe that's also part of why I, I like bridge, bridge building. I love my dad. I mean, <laughs> what can I say? We debate a lot, but he'll send me articles that I know are completely fraudulent and all it takes me is like quoting a piece and Googling it and sending it back. And he's like, oh yeah, I guess that wasn't a real news article. Um, we live in this information age where you can check it out. You can find out where it comes from. Um, so y'all are probably better at figuring it out than me because of my old age and my Google ability is, is a, bit, a bit limited, um, but it's out there to find out if it's the right source or not. And um, Who's benefiting from the division? And earlier in your talk, uh, without saying specifically, I just it is very apparent that you would advocate finding information from a variety of sources. Yeah, absolutely. Please diversify your social media feeds. In fact, most of the studies have shown there's not a lot of bias. One way, or, you know, everyone's like, oh, you know, social media wants to shut down all. Um, you know, it, it has a, a progressive bias, right? It's, it's anti-conservative. That's actually hasn't been true. There's disinformation from several sides. Uh, you will get a lot of it, whatever, you know, that's how the algorithms are made. It's gonna keep feeding you that same thing. So if you started believing one false narrative, you're gonna get fed a whole lot of it, which will seem like what you believe is, is true and what's actually out there. So yeah, again, Americans are good at questioning authority. We always have been. So I'd, I'd lean on that value that we have to question and be like, you know. So uh, Dean Thomas is, is curious if you found yourself sometimes debating with trolls, engaging in bad faith, and is it worth continuing to engage in case the conversation moves towards sincerity over time? And do you have strategies for helping that make, make that move? I don't think social media is the place to do this. Um, so I'll say that, that yeah, Definitely, you know, I have um, a few times gone at it with trolls, but then it's very hard to have that authentic conversation on social media. Um, but in person, I will absolutely, even if I think they're trolling me, because I, I think I'm a little bit, uh, you know, like I said, I was a debate nerd. I, you know, part of me just likes to get into it. But no, on social media, I don't think it's worth it. I'd rather just not engage at all. Okay, so we're going to finish up with uh, a question that's come in, and I have to apologize in advance to the person who sent this in. I'm having a little trouble understanding the question, but I'm going to read it, and maybe, maybe Anisha, in your wisdom, you'll, you'll have a good take. But how would we approach the divisive opinions, such as those who focus more on the technical aspects of an opportunity than the opportunity itself after trying to understand them? And an example would be about deportation and refugees and how other people may downplay the urgency of the matter. I'm not sure I totally understand either. I think that what I'm reading about it is about how sometimes folks will get into a technicality of what you said, if I'm mm. reading that right. 
mm -hmm. and try to just use types of false arguments to win the argument. Wow. Um, and so this is just, I think if I'm reading into it and I have a great resource I like to share with people are all the different types of bad arguments people make to try to derail you from the point and how to combat them. I think that's very helpful if you're trying to find common ground because it's easy to point out, you know, the red herring arguments and things like that. Um, and okay, yeah, great. That's what, that's what you meant. I, I suspect that you understand that question really better than I did. Thank you. So, uh, Nisha, I know everybody here joins me in thanking you for so being so generous tonight and sharing your experiences. Uh, thank you to Julie Martinez and the communications office as well, and everybody who attended. As a reminder, uh, students and anyone else that wants to spend a little more time with Nisha tomorrow, you can come to the Pioneer Room at 12:30, and uh, we'll have a, a Nisha will zoom in, but we'll be in person. You can bring your lunch in. And uh, we hope that at some point, Nisha, you can uh, come in person to the bluegrass country in the not too distant future and take advantage of some true Transylvania hospitality. So yeah. good evening to everybody. I would love that. Thank you, guys. Okay.